So hello, this is Terrell Russell. I'm with the IRITS Consortium. This is the last talk of our UGM 2020. We'll have some lightning talks after this, but I will talk about uh, a new client that I worked on this last few months, uh, the AWS Lambda function for S3. It's an IRODS client that uh, talks in a couple directions. So first of all, of course, why, why is this a thing? And the design goals around this were uh, largely to be able to improve the ingest experience for a large number of objects coming into S3, flowing into S3 and, and getting them registered in the IRS catalog. So we would like uh, this thing that we're going to build here to play nicely with the universe of tools that already exist that know how to speak to S3. We don't need to teach everyone how to speak the IRS protocol. We want to get out of the way and let all of the microscopes and all of the third-party tools that already speak S3 do their job and be able to pick up uh, notifications or events coming out of the S3 uh, universe and uh, parse those, chop them up, and inform the IRODS catalog of that information. Uh, this means that uh, we're going to write a piece of software that's sitting outside uh, of IROD server, so it's an IROD's client, and we want it to push things into the catalog, which will then, of course, trigger any data management, any automated policies that may be in place in your zone will trigger just like anything else, like if anybody else came through uh, the front door. So when these events occur, uh, data management fires uh, because the policy boundary was crossed. So in order to get there, some of the things that we thought about, well, how should we write this? What, what, what language should it be? Where should it live? And very quickly, it, it became clear that we would like this client to be written in Python. It has all the functionality we need, and uh, we can run that in Amazon's uh, Lambda service. Uh, there are other uh, services like uh, Lambda for other uh, cloud uh, deployments, and so theoretically, this will also be um, possible to reproduce, if not identically, in, in other cloud uh, infrastructures as well. For now, the use case was doing this in Amazon's um, uh, Lambda. And then, of course, defining success, we would then have near real-time asynchronous uh, catalog updates for both creates and moves, as well as uh, deletes. And that's uh, an improvement over the automated ingest uh, tooling that we've had, where we could not see uh, deletes uh, because those were not picked up by our scanning uh, approach. So here we are. Uh, this, this is what we built and it works. So files that are created, renamed, or deleted all appear in IRODS relatively quickly. Uh, there's a little bit of a delay just because the entire system is asynchronous and it's all in Amazon's cloud. They could be traveling uh, you know, across zones, across countries, uh, but they do, they do move pretty quick. Um, IRODS is assumed to have any S3 storage resources configured with uh, the cacheless attached mode that we introduced last year. Uh, Justin's talk earlier this year uh, will also use this cacheless attached uh, host mode. So this shouldn't change anything when we move to the streaming interface of the S3 plugin. Uh, you must configure your Lambda to trigger on all of the object created and object removed events that are defined by Amazon. So obviously we wanna pick up all of those so that we get told what's happening so we can keep the catalog up to date. And um, the IRODS connection, so the, again, this is an IRODS client, so uh, you have to have the, the zone name and the username and all that kind of stuff, uh, just like you would in a, uh, other kind of client configurations. Those live in the parameter store, uh, so that's where you put your secrets and uh, that's how you would connect to, uh, the client would pick up those uh, credentials and, and talk to IRODS from there. If you do have SSL turned on with IRODS, then this can handle it through the Python library. And the certificate that you would need would be placed in the Lambda package alongside uh, the function. And so it's just a relative path uh, from the function to be able to pick up the certificate and then everything works uh, as expected. If we originally had it somewhere else and it turns out that there's a limit to the size of the uh, key values you can put in the parameter store. So if you have a long certificate chain, uh, this was the right answer. So not only can we pick up uh, changes coming from, or events coming from a single bucket, uh, this Lambda function can be configured to receive events from multiple sources at the same time. And uh, this is 
uh, a little bit trickier because you then have to define which resource in IRODs, which storage resource in IRODs that these S3 objects are now associated with. So if the IRODs default resource is not defined in the environment in the parameter store, then the Lambda can effectively be in multi-bucket mode and it will derive the name of the target resource from the name of the bucket. So by convention, you would have to have some similarly named protocol around these buckets and then your IRODs resources would have to be uh, kind of similarly named as well. So by default, if you're in this mode, the Lambda function will append an underscore S3 to the bucket name from which the event was retrieved. And then it would put, uh, it would try to register that object into the IROD's resource of the same name as the bucket with an additional post um, a suffix of underscore S3. That's a, that's a configuration that you can make in, uh, and you can change that if you don't like it. In addition to uh, the multi-bucket and the straight S3 to Lambda to IRODs uh, flow, we've also got um, these other configurations that you could do in Amazon. And so uh, they've got a simple notification uh, service and a simple queuing service. So if you would like uh, a particular S3 bucket to notify multiple systems of events that are happening, you would use the simple notification uh, service. That's a, that's a branch out mode. Uh, our configuration. So the Lambda can listen and be one of those uh, services that's updated when uh, the SNS uh, gets an event. And then of course, Lambda parses it and tells IRODs about it. Uh, alternatively, you can have a, uh, a queue. So it doesn't branch out, but it does provide um, kind of a store and forward mechanism. Uh, again, the Lambda would get um, uh, the notification and, and talk to IRODs. And so both of those work and it's a slightly different parsing uh, of the events that come through uh, when, I, when, when the Lambda sees it, but it just it, it un unwraps those uh, events and looks for the, uh, the good S3 information in there and then off it goes. After that point, it's the same code that fires. There's a couple limitations uh, to this current 1.0 release, which came out last month. Uh, obviously, all of these systems are fully decoupled. So S3 is completely decoupled. It's what allows Amazon to make all their money. Uh, so it's decoupled from the Lambda. So therefore, there is no such thing as an actual rename event coming out of S3. So a rename, uh, S3 turns into a create and a delete message. And because they are asynchronous, they can be, uh, they arrive not necessarily in the same order. Sometimes the create will show up before the delete, and sometimes the delete will show up before the create. Uh, there's no way to change that. It's just the nature of the system. And uh, so what happens being downstream from that is that IRODS actually just makes a new data object, which is a new logical path in the catalog. And there's no association between the one that was deleted and the one that was created. And this is not normally a problem unless you have some AVUs associated with the one that just got deleted. Um, if that's the case, then your metadata is now lost. So this could be remedied with a little bit more work around checksums and comparing and maybe writing something down in a scratch space and keeping it up to date. Uh, we haven't quite figured that out yet. We haven't heard something that was obviously the right answer uh, to move this forward, but uh, at this point, Mostly this is being used as an initial ingest tool. So there's not any AVU metadata associated with these objects. And so, so far it's okay. Uh, we would love to hear uh, your brilliant idea of how to make that better. Uh, obviously checksums could be expensive and potentially slow. So we wanna make sure we have a good beat on that. The other limitation is that the queuing system configuration is configured to, uh, is limited to a batch size of one at this point. Um, if we, increase the batch size, uh, you obviously would reduce the cost of how many times you're firing the Lambda, but um, operating on more than one message means that there needs to be some way for uh, the Lambda to deal with um, partial successes, also known as partial failures. So if you have a batch size of 10 and one or two of those 10 doesn't succeed for some reason, uh, a timing issue or a, a funny character or something, something else weird, the internet goes away, then what happens, right? Do, the, do those eight or nine that successfully made it into IRODs get pulled back out of IRODs? Do things go back into the queue? Do they come back out again? 
Uh, so we have uh, a little bit more work to figure out what to do in the case of a batch size being greater than one. Right now, it's very obvious. Uh, if it fails, it goes back in the queue and it tries again later. So this is new code. It's out in the last month, but it is in production in a couple places. Uh, happy to hear any questions or uh, other types of things from people. And of course, uh, the pre-release testing was done uh, in the Amazon cloud that uh, BMS is paying for. And so thank you to Bruce and Squibb for uh, helping that uh, move forward. I'm going to look over to the Slack channel here and moderate my own questions. So Mike says, could the, Mike Conway from the NIHS says, could the IROD side cache events before action to discern a rename and substitute that op instead of delete create? So there is a bit of a stream processing back and forth as well. Uh, I don't know the right answer yet. Uh, I think there's probably something smart to be done where you could watch these for a few seconds, gather them, watch them. At what point do you deal with a, a an orphan, you know, like the creative showed up, but it, but not the delete, or th there's no information in the event that ties them together. So you would have to hold on to them for a little bit, introduce a delay in your system, potentially still have a mismatch over time. And it's the question is the error handling. And you really don't want to be wrong because then you possibly lost, you know, your AVUs. Is there any other questions? I'm getting some. Check one other place. All right. I think we're good. We're going to start our. Uh, let's see one more one more time. Multiple screens. Would we expect this to be easy to implement in uh, Google or Azure? I imagine yes. Uh, the Python code is not terribly complicated. Um, it's it's just mostly the the ability to parse the events, pick up the configuration from the right place and then either run a registration or a delete or a, uh, an unreg. Um, not, not, too, not too complex from a, from a functional standpoint. And uh, thank you, we're gonna move on to the next thing.